Welcome, Good Shepherd Christian Church, to worship on this Sunday and part of Eastertide. We come bringing the light in as we abide in Christ, and he abides in us. We come recognizing that the light is powerful and that we need that in our lives, and it's for us, the disciples, you, me, any believer, for the disciples to shine the light. So we are glad that you are worshiping with us at Good Shepherd Christian Church. We invite you to come to our website, goodshepherdchristianchurch.org, and you can fill out a prayer request form if you have a prayer request need that can be shared with our chain or can be shared just with the pastors. We invite you to come and receive information on what's happening, our weekly mailers or our twice a month um, newsletter that comes out, just to see the activities of who we are. But we also settle in and we recognize that we have missed each other. And so I wanna personally invite you to try out our in-person parking lot worships that we are doing. They are on the second and fourth Sundays of each month. So we'll gather this next week on March 9th at 10 a.m. Bring your chair, bring your communion, if you need to, bring something warm. 
Um, and weather permitting, we will gather in a semicircle in our lower parking lot with distance, with singing, with fellowship, with joy. I would love to see you there if you're able to make it. And if you're not, and we have not had a chance to connect, please, please, by all means, feel free to call the church office or call me directly. I'd be happy to give my cell phone number. It's on Breeze for anyone who's looking for it. Be happy to connect with you. Let's take a deep breath. Let us be in a worshipful place and let us attune to this opening prayer. The vine emerges from the earth, nourished and nourishing, rises without visible connection, roots hidden, promise unknown, strong to withstand storms, fragile when plucked too soon. So it is that we grow, nourished by invisible connections to the living God, called to nourish that which is seen and that which is yet buried within. The scripture is taken from John 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Abide in me. When we read these specific chapters, of the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 17, they really address a significant question. If you read these with the question of, what does the risen and departing Christ have to say to his church? What does the risen and departing Christ have to say to his church? 
Chapters 14 through 17 of John give us many answers, many answers. It's rich in assurances, in warnings, in instructions, in promises of Christ telling his future church. But out of that, out of the entire gospel of John, one of the most significant verbs is abide, abide, to abide in him. We know the Ten Commandments. We know the fruits of the Spirit. We know the golden rule. We even know when Micah asks, what does the Lord require of us? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. We know all of these. Jesus tells us what's the greatest commandment to love with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love God and to love one another. We know these. And this scripture today, especially, especially this part of the Gospel of John, really comes in to say, here's what you know of me, what I want you to carry into the future church. Here are the dangers. Here are the warnings, here are the promises. And abide in me is the most significant of them all. Abide in me, hold on, keep me at the center. For God is love, transforming love. Love for us to take in as the beloved and love for us to give out. If we can do all those things and abide in Christ, we may see transformation amongst our entire world. The world that you see, that you interact with, the world that our neighbors interacts with, the world that we are a part of, and we may see transformation in ourselves. Abide. I used this scripture for my ordination it was back at the end of January, January 31st of 2004, about the vine, the vine grower. Who is the vine tender, the grower? God, right? And the vine is Jesus. We are the branches. And apart from that, church, apart from Jesus, we're really nothing. If you read this in more detail, you specifically start to pick up some words. If we're not in relationship to Christ, then we're missing some things. When we are in relationship to Christ, it's a gift of grace. A gift of grace with gratitude, with joy. But when we step back and we think with our egos or our own self-worth, if we think we've got it or that God's forgotten about us or we've forgotten about God, when we, as the branches, are no longer connected to the vine, we're powerless, wordless, prayerless, fruitless, and hopeless. But when we remember that as branches, we are part of the vine, the vine tended to, by God, our holy creator, Pruned, which does not feel good when it's happening. Pruning often feels like, what is going on? And it's very painful. But giving new life when we abide and stay connected in the vine. When we trust in those times of struggle. When we see through that it may not be anything that we ever wanted. No, please do not prune that off. I really, really want that. And yet trust that more will grow, more will flourish that never could have been until we pruned it. When we abide in those times, in those struggles, when we can see each other as beloved, when we can love our enemies, when we can abide in Christ in all that we do, transformation can happen. Church, this is for our world and this is for us. This is for Good Shepherd Christian Church. 
We are coming out of this pandemic. We're not there yet, but we are coming. We are gathering information and making plans. We're worshiping in the parking lot. We're looking at what technology do we need to tweak so that we can be in person and live stream. What do we need to do to connect, but really let the Spirit of God flow through all that you and I and the church are doing? To let it flow. Abide in God. Abide in Christ. I think that sums it for us. There's a story that Fred Craddock used to tell. It's in one of his books. If you remember Fred Craddock, disciple of Christ, kind of the granddaddy of stories, former professor at Emory University, professor of New Testament. And he would tell a story about how important it is to know that we are the beloved. He told a story that he and his wife were out traveling and they ate at a nice restaurant and somebody welcomed them and said, well, you know, a local welcomed them and said, where are you from? And they told them from out of state, told them a little bit about themselves. And they said, oh, well, you know, what, what do you do for a living? He's like, well, I'm a professor of New Testament in seminary. And this person started having a conversation, this man. And he talked to them as an older man and he chatted. He said, oh, I have a wonderful sermon illustration for you. One that you can tell all of your students. And he went on to talk to him. He talked about a boy, a boy born in 1870. A boy born out of wedlock. Now, in our times out of wedlock, we make family in all different ways. But in 1870, that was not the case. And so this boy was really teased a lot looked down upon, really pushed aside. And about the time that this boy was 12 years old, this boy was first raised by his mom. And when she could no longer do that, he was adopted at age nine, but still had this, this stigma on him. So got teased, still felt less than. And it came out sometimes in low self-esteem, which some of us would think very shy, very meek, but really the man said it really came out more in his swinging his fists to really defend himself. And at the, about the age 12 for this boy, so it would have been about 1882, a new pastor came, pastor of his church, and he was asking the kids about themselves, learning about the children, and said, well, who's your father? Well, who's your father? Trying to understand the connection because let me tell you, even as a pastor in this day when you're new, you're still trying to make the family connections. But he didn't realize how he was really singling out somebody who had already been hurt, who had been put apart. But he immediately saw it in the boy's eyes when he asked that question and knew that he had asked the wrong thing. And so the pastor stopped and said, wait, I see a resemblance. <gasps> You're a child of God. You're a child of God. The man went on to tell Fred Craddock this story and how that changed that boy's life. How he would answer anytime somebody said, well, who's your father? Well, I'm a child of God. Well, I'm a child of God. Well, I am a child of God. And then as the man left, he said, this changed everything for me. I'm a child of God. And he and his wife walked out. Fred Craddock and his wife asked the waiter, the serving attendants, do you know who that man was? And they said, well, yeah, sure. That's Ben Hooper. Ben Hooper, the former governor of Tennessee child of God. Ben Hooper, when you go through and you actually look this up on the internet, he was baptized at age 15. He graduated from Carson Newman in Jefferson City in 1890, and he became a lawyer. He served in the House of Representatives. 
He was captain in the Spanish-American War, and he was governor of Tennessee for two terms. After serving as governor later in his life, he was one of the purchasing agents for the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. He died in 1957, a child of God. Who's your father? You are a child of God. When we abide, when we see each other as children of God, when we hold on to that love, even the people that make us most uncomfortable, even the people that we wonder at and think are so strange, when we abide in the love of God, we learn about those people, we see potential in them, we see the beloved, and we understand what it means to be brothers and sisters in Christ, to be a child of God. And it transforms lives. It transforms communities. I dare say it transforms a nation and the world. And it especially transforms our hearts. Desmond Tutu had a saying, we were created by love, for love, and so that we should love. He goes on to say, none of us is a mere divine afterthought. None of us is a mere divine afterthought. We are children of God. May we abide, even in the hard times, may we hold on tight to that vine. May we turn to it for nutrients, for guidance, for growth. And when we start to feel us unraveling, may we do what the vines do where we wrap on tight and hold to Christ as beloved, abiding brothers and sisters. We are all children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Children of God, we come together in this time of prayer. We come together to think about what we have to say to God and to wonder what God has to say to us, to make space for that, to listen for God's voice, for the moment of connection and transformation that comes, that flows when we are connected to the vine. So let us abide in this moment in God's presence together. Let us be together in a spirit of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we come together this morning holding the world, knowing that you are holding all of us. We come together seeking connection, 
connection with you and with one another. And help us to remember that in that seeking, you are with us. You are looking us full in the face and saying, you are my beloved child. And you are inviting us to look each other full in the face and see the resemblance and see the love that abides, that holds us close, that connects us. And so, as your beloved children, created by love, here for love, so that we can love, help us to offer this revolutionary love to the world and to dare to receive it ourselves. Help us as we seek to continue to live through this pandemic, to pray for health and safety. Help us as we continue to hold places that are torn apart by the pandemic and then, whether it is war or famine, we ask your presence there in those broken places. We pray that in your abiding love, you would help us to listen deeply to stories of pain and to stories of transformation and grace. Empower us as we seek to be your people, seeking to show your love to all we meet. And we ask, O oh God, that you would speak to us words of comfort and challenge. For we know those words come to us through Jesus the Christ, who is our teacher, our healer, our friend, and our savior, and who calls us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, this is a table where we come to remember that we are, in fact, in deep relationship with Christ Jesus. We come to this table to remember that we are children of God. This is, in some respects, the kids' table. We come here because we want to be fed and nourished, connected to that transforming love, to the vine. And so I invite you, whether you feel like it or not, whether you've got it all together this morning or you're not so sure yet, join us. Come to this table where God is the host and says, welcome, my beloved. Here's a seat for you. So we remember that Jesus welcomed his beloved at the table, his beloved friends, and he would take a loaf of bread and bless it and break it. And he would say to them, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do this, remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out for them and said, drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant offered for you for forgiveness. As often as you do this, remember me. And so remembering God's abiding love for us in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the bread and the cup led by our elder, Rich Pejo. Gracious God, we have heard today that you are the vine grower, that your son Jesus is the vine, and that we are the branches of a flourishing plant that produces bountiful results. As we come to your table, we give thanks for the bread and the cup as reminders that Jesus died and was resurrected for the absolution of our sins 
enabling each of us to grow stronger as branches of that vine. As children of your love, compassion, mercy, and nourishment, we have opportunities to assist one another in ways that continue to strengthen our resolve to fashion a better world. It starts with us, our families, neighbors, and friends. So now, as we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we rejoice in the opportunity you have given us to grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we partake together. Body of Christ and the cup of blessing. So beloved, abide in Christ, for he is the vine and we are the branches, and apart from him we can do nothing. But with him, beloved, with him, when we abide, we have hope, we have light, we bring life-giving changes to this world. Abide in him and go in peace. Amen. Thank you.